Hey, you guys, this is Josh with Homesteading Family, and welcome to this week's episode of the Pantry Chat Food for Thought. As you can see, Carolyn is not here this week, but I am really excited to have my good friend Noah Sanders on today. Uh, Noah is a farmer, a homesteader, an author, a teacher, and, and much, much more. And, uh, but he focuses on helping people love Jesus and love and connect agriculture with their faith and farming so that they can find purpose in glorifying God and serving others while excelling in land stewardship. And that, that we, we, we have a kindred spirit in that. And, and Noah has just dedicated his life to this. And as an avid farmer, he's ran a successful, I think, farm to market business for 13 years. He can tell us a little bit more about that here in a second. And um, he wrote a book called Redeeming the Dirt, and that actually had a huge impact on me and my uh, homesteading journey. And, um, and he's also got a ministry. I think your ministry, or at least your online ministry, is called Redeeming the Dirt. And also, he's worked with Farming God's Way and now has a program called Well Watered Gardens. And so, Noah, welcome. It's really exciting to have you here and to get to talk uh, all things composting today. Uh, I know we both love soil and, and have a common saying in that uh, dirt is dead. Yes. So, uh, <laughs> welcome. How are you? Thanks. Yep. Doing great. Doing great. And uh, excited to be able to talk about the dirt. You know, our, my, actually, my, the, the title of my book was Born Again Dirt. Um, it's a bit confusing because I use Redeeming the Dirt as the main uh, name for our, our ministry, but just kind of that idea of that. Um, you know, for me, connecting the faith in farming where I, you know, God made man, it says in Genesis, out of the dust of the ground. And mm. so we're like, you know, when we when we have that like new life because of Jesus, we are like born again dirt. But also like that should also transform the way that we uh, view the earth because it's God's and view our role there. And, and so kind of the idea of that is that like our dirt or our agriculture or the things we do with the land should also be born again. Like we should approach it with a whole different perspective of awe and wonder and respect and like responsibility that, um, you know, is hard to have when we still are dealing with a lot of the pride and selfishness and unfaithfulness that just comes as a result of sin before, you know, uh, we kind of have some of that heart change that Jesus can give us. So that's why I'm excited because I feel like, you know, it, it gives agriculture gives us a real boots on approach to do the things God tells us that he wants us to be about. Um, but also our faith and, and, and Jesus really, I found, provides so many amazing practical solutions as we approach it with, you know, kind of that perspective of stewardship and awe and wonder for the design and creation. Well, and I love that perspective that you bring to it and, and just the acknowledgement that is, as people having faith in Jesus Christ, that we, we are here to steward creation and what God's given us. We do have a role and responsibility and while we have dominion over it, that dominion speaks to and requires that we steward it well, right? Mm -hmm. And, and um, that is so, so important. And when it comes to dirt, dirt is dead. Dirt is not redeemed, but soil is alive, right? And, and it, it, it's, there's so much there that cries out of God's creation and his, his um, just love for us and honestly his redemption in exemplified in nature. Mm -hmm. and, and it's fun to get to talk about that with you today and, and something that, you know, as simple as compost, yet runs so deep. And um, so tell us a little bit before we get into some of the composting about what you're doing right now and your, your kind of your transition, because I think you started, besides homesteading, you were farming for a living, and you've kind of had a few transitions into what you're focusing on now. Can you, can you share that journey with us a little bit? Yeah, so I was really blessed to have a dad that was really involved in my life growing up, um, both from my home education side of things that my mom obviously was really involved in, but also just in discipleship and, and then facilitating as I was interested in different things entrepreneurially and interested in farming that he really helped me to kind of get off the ground running at an early, kind of get an early start. So I was started a small scale farm um, enterprise right out of high school. Uh, my last assignment for high school was a business plan. And then my dad and I went together and started a farm um, business. So I did a lot of uh, meats and eggs and stuff like Joel Salatin style first. 
And, uh, but I really like growing plants. I like gardening and crops. It just, I didn't really know how to do it well at the beginning. So most of our income came from eggs, you know, pastured eggs and broilers and those kind of things. And then uh, over a period of years, we eventually felt like God told us to sell our animal operation to a cousin of mine. And we then focused on the vegetables. Uh, we sold mostly at farmer's markets for a long time. And then eventually we started to uh, look at what are some what were some long term options that we wanted to have for um, our business model and how we could best serve customers. So we actually uh, developed something that's similar to a CSA, but we didn't like the traditional CSA model. So we developed what we called our farmship program. And it was kind of like a subscription model that was completely customized. We had about 30 families that we, you know, pulled them and we grew what they loved. And then we could bring them, you know, we partnered with some other farmers with, uh, with, you know, some other products, but we basically just made our living on about 30 families that we delivered vegetables, meat, eggs, baked goods, you know, to each week and curated customized boxes based on their preferences. And we really liked that. It was really a good, um, a, a much stronger connection than the farmer's market, which is a great launch, you know, for, for those mm -hmm. relationships, but isn't necessarily, you know, the, sometimes, you know, my siblings would get married on Saturdays, you know, and when you sell like <laughs> a couple thousand dollars of produce on a Saturday, it's a big sacrifice to come if you don't have somebody to do it for you, you know? Um, right. so we were able to just like drop off vegetables on one day a week and just people had coolers on their porch. So I could take one of my kids with me and we would just drive around all day long, you know, dropping off bags and doing some shopping. And so it was much more family friendly and, and, uh, our customers were super happy because we only brought them what they wanted and yet it was automated. So we really, really loved that. But over the years, we also, in writing the book that I did, and then we, I went and got trained in um, Foundations for Farming over in Africa, which used to be Farming God's Way, and there's still a group uh, that's still trained under that name by a lot of people, Farming God's Way. Um, but the founder, Brian Oldreeve, I met him and then kind of learned what, what they kind of call uh, what's known over there as conservation agriculture and is uh, no-till, mulch approach, um, and then compost system. But 80% of, of it, of the approach is very much a heart-based, discipleship-based, Jesus-centered kind of uh, life transformation that then results in amazing crops, but hits at the heart of where that poverty, you know, and poor stewardship is coming from. And so we started training some of that here in the U.S. And then at the beginning of last year, in 2022, uh, we felt like God told us that it, you know, like we, he wanted us to shut our farm business down and just focus on the training. Cause I, I have six kids and one on the way, not as many as you, Josh, but, um, you're getting there. I'm getting there. So we, uh, you know, at this season in life, I don't have a lot of like margin for just bonus stuff, which was what I kind of do some of the training in the past. Um, and, uh, so it was kind of like I either made a living farming or I could make, you know, I could focus on the training. So we just felt like the next season that God, really had given us so many amazing mentors so that we could pass on this information to others. And it felt like a good thing to shut down our farm when it was what we had always wanted it to be, you know, and, uh, and, and, you know, it's like, you don't want to give to the Lord that which costs you nothing, you know, and especially yeah. if we were moving into a teaching role, you know, it was a very emotional thing for us to, to kind of tell all these friends of ours, basically that we've been selling to for about a decade that we weren't gonna be doing that this next year. Um, but it's, we've seen God bless it in so many ways. So we're mostly focused right now on teaching uh, simple low-tech food production to people, whether it's families and communities or people that are going overseas. Um, some of these, these simple techniques that we learned from Foundations for Farming. And especially in order to kind of contextualize it in uh, the, a first world context where people aren't just growing corn for subsistence, where people want to grow vegetables we developed um, a kind of built on one of the concepts that we learned there about the well water garden, which is uh, a garden that is kind of a model or a training garden, a visible, you know, beacon of hope mm -hmm. in communities that people can come and learn from that's based in the, in displaying the humility, faithfulness and unselfishness of Jesus. And so we started what's called the well water garden project and <clears throat> kind of have created some resources that people can use to plant simple gardens, not reinvent the wheel, but have a simple recipe that allows them to get some success in the foundational things they need to be, you know, to, 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 to get started well on that journey of growing their own food. But also with that, the DNA built in of um, 
multiplication where we're encouraging everybody that is gardening and growing to train other people, even if that's one person a year, because there's so many people around the world that are starving to death, surrounded with amazing resources, and they need to be taught good stewardship. And it's not something any one of us can go and do to make an, you know, like personally to make an impact for millions and millions of people that need that. But if we can have that, um, that DNA of if I can be faithful to just invest in two people a year and keep that rate of multiplication going with my garden and then, and encourage those people to do the same. We could, you could have a million wild water gardens in 10 years. And I think in 14 years, it'd be a billion, you know? So part of the vision is just empowering the everyday person to say, you can make a difference in spreading the knowledge of food production and hope by just being faithful to invest in the people that God brings along you know, in your sphere of influence. And we're starting to see that really take off with people training all over the country now. And so I spend a lot of time um, on Zoom calls like this and on in on person, you know, and and doing in person trainings on our farm to invest in people that are going to be multipliers or leaders and trainers in their own communities and then supporting them as they're going back and doing that. Wow. I just, I love that. I mean, I love your heart for the Lord, but I love your heart combining that with agriculture and really with food resiliency is what I hear coming out of that. You know, you say a billion people and I go, wow, what America is, I don't know what we are, 350 million people. And and like, wow, could you imagine if every house had a garden and it doesn't have to be huge, but could mm-hmm. you imagine, you know, what, what that does for our resiliency as a people and a community and, and, um, your 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 methods are making that so simple, and I want to encourage you guys. While our, while our talk today isn't all about that, it's about getting down into the the soil a little bit and, and compost. Um, we'll share some information with you at the end, and I want you to check out what Noah is doing because it's it's uh, something you could probably do in your community uh, to share your faith and not just your faith in Christ, but also just in in this homesteading world and growing your own food with other people. And I mean, what, for those of us that have a passion of this, what a great, great combination. Mm. um, So that's, that's exciting. And it's exciting to know to see the journey that you've taken and the sacrifice of giving up something you love. And I think, I think if we're walking with the Lord, we're going to be challenged at times, not necessarily always into missions per se. I mean, we're all always in missions, you know, in, in some form, but we're always going to be challenged for truly following Jesus. Um, he's going to challenge us to go to new places and do new things, whatever that looks like. Mm-hmm. And so I think you're, you're a great encouragement to all of us that uh, we need to not be static, you know, in the Lord. We need to always be looking to see where, to, where does he have us to go and, and what's next and how can we glorify him. So thanks, thanks for sharing that story and for all you're doing out there. Um, with that, we're talking compost today, which is at the heart of building healthy soil for, for most of us. And um, we're going to get into troubleshooting compost a little bit because people get a lot of hangups on composting and, and how to get going. But first, can you just talk us through in your definition, what is compost? And can you even describe just basically how you go about it? I think most of our listeners are very familiar with compost and probably have even tried it and hence why we're doing troubleshooting, but just kind of give us an introduction to composting. Yeah. Well, the reason I really care about composting, uh, first of all, I think it it really is a way to mimic the natural fertility system that we see in creation. And so that I really am passionate about, but also there are a lot of people around the world that are very dependent on uh, chemical fertilizers for growing the food that they need to, you know, just survive. And uh, in this day and age, fertilizer prices are going up or it's hard to get. So a big uh, motivation for us is, you know, having a tool you can equip somebody that has very little resources um, to still be able to grow their own food successfully with just what they have readily available around them. And this is not a new concept. I live not far from Tuskegee where Tuskegee Institute that was founded by Booker T. Washington and then Mm -hmm. where George Washington Carver worked as well. And they were working with the poor farmers after the Civil War. And compost was something that George Washington Carver taught and their experimental station there that they used to teach farmers in the local area. All they used was compost and they grew like amazing crops there. So we're just kind of continuing that 
uh, that tradition, you know, that heritage we have of um, teaching people to use what they have readily available around them. Because, you know, if you're growing your own food, that's great. But if you're dependent on a purchase resource, whether it's, you know, chemical fertilizer, or if you are always buying seeds and you don't know how to save your own or whatever, you're still just like one season out, right? You're just like have a buffer of one season of food resiliency. Cause after mm -hmm. that, Maybe you're not buying your food. That's great. But if you're still buying your all your inputs, not locally, then you're there's still a degree of dependency there. And there's still a degree of, in many cases, parts of the world, corrupt governments use that as a way mm. to control people by votes, that kind of thing. So we want to we really have a, a passion for equipping people with tools that can set them free. In addition to like at the same time, you're healing the land, you know, and, and you're yeah. doing something amazing. So compost, uh, the way I normally define it for people is really healthy soil. Like soil is not something that is like the land. When we talk about the land, it's interesting in the Bible, we're commanded to let the land rest. Like that was part of, well, not like mm -hmm. the nation of Israel was commanded to let the land rest. And, and there was a ethical like um, way that even, you know, God even punished the nation of Israel for their abuse of the land. It's interesting in Revelation actually says God will destroy those who destroy the earth. I mean, like the earth and creation, God cares about that a lot, but the land itself, <clears throat> part of like telling us to rest the land mm -hmm. implies that there's life in the land, right? You don't rest something that's dead, right. <laughs> you rest yeah. something that's alive. Yeah. So understanding that there's so much light, good soil, good, healthy land, has life in it and i think most of us are familiar with the concept you know that like the revelation that one teaspoon of healthy soil has more microbes in it than there mm -hmm. are people on the face of the earth which is just mind-boggling i mean we know more about outer space than we do what's how the yeah. soil works and it's That's just incredible incredible and i and i i show people all the time i'm like we're beating our heads up against the wall sometimes trying to or maybe beating our heads up against a tree i don't know if we're in the garden uh, trying to grow food and get plants that survive. But you look right normally around us in our, our local our environments that we're in, most of us, and there's so much lush growth that we can't even keep the stuff cut back and mowed back, you know, enough to, we're trying to just keep it from taking back over our homesteads. And we're not fertilizing that. We're not plowing it. We're not spraying it with herbicides, pesticides, anything. So especially related to the fertility, it's like, how are those plants getting fed? You know, without even mm -hmm. in the organic realm, what if you're not putting feather meal on there, you know, or pelleted chicken manure fertilizer? What like how are you getting your nitrogen? How are you getting all that stuff? And it really has to do with this amazing fertilizer factory that's in the soil where you have this interaction of the minerals that are down at the bottom that have all sorts of cool, you know, uh, nutrients for our plants. And then all the organic matter that's being applied on the top. And then this interaction where they meet of all these microorganisms, breaking them down, eating each other, all this food system, and then interacting with the root systems themselves of the trees that are secreting sugars into the soil from the photosynthesis. And all that's working together <clears throat> and slowly releasing all that nutrients that is in the organic matter and the minerals mm -hmm. in a way that allows our plants to access it in a way that is sustainable and can keep going year after year compost you know most poor soil or if we're taking away from the land especially if we're harvesting stuff we can eventually end up with just you know our dead soil dead dirt like we talked mm -hmm. about is if we look at it it's normally just the minerals and we're just left with sand or clay or whatever it is that's in our local area so if we want to heal that land and we want to give back to that land the two things we're missing are is the organic matter and the microorganisms, the fungus, the bacteria, all the all those things that are in there. So that's what compost is. Compost is organic matter that's teeming with life that we're putting back onto our soil to kind of rebuild uh, that balance of those three items in a way that can uh, start rebuilding that natural fertilizer system. And it's much more like uh, functions like in health. We talk about probiotics, fermented foods, all that kind of cool stuff that helps our gut. That's kind of what compost is for the soil. And the other day I was working with a garden uh, class and they had brought in, I wasn't able to bring some compost, but they had brought in some compost soil mix kind of stuff. And it was really good organic matter and it might've had some microbes in it, but I just remember looking at it compared to what I normally look at with the compost I make. 
when I make compost and when I'm evaluating, I look at it up close. You can see it, there's just stuff running all over it. I mean, you're not even looking under a microscope, but there's all sorts of life. There's mm -hmm. roly polies and worms and little springtail things hopping around and ants. And it's just like teeming with life. This other stuff that was commercially made, I grabbed a handful of it. And I looked and I'm like, it's just like silence. There was just nothing, you know, nothing happening. It was beautiful. It was black. It was decomposed, but there was nothing happening there. And thankfully, you know, we're going to put it on, we were putting it on the dirt. We were putting mulch on it. It was going to, you know, stuff was going to come back in it, but it was not going to be near as effective as what we, what I think of in terms of living compost because of the, the fact that those microorganisms are the key ingredient in healthy compost and compost differs from a fertilizer in that fertilizers you're bringing in those those nutrients directly in either a liquid fertilizer form you know whether it's manure tea and you know manures especially or other kind of um teas that you make you're actually adding the phosphorus you're adding the nitrogen you're adding the potassium and we've got to kind of regulate it and be careful that we don't it's you know overdo it too much or put make sure we put the right amount because we're feeding the plants directly compost if you take a nutrient analysis of that most of it's locked up still in the organic matter mm -hmm. and it's the microbes that are there that are going to mine that and make it available for your plants it's kind of like if you look at a farm you may have cows out there and grass but the potential for how much milk you could produce there's may no may not be any milk there yet right mm -hmm. but you get the right mm -hmm. ingredients you get cows and grass and you got a barn and somebody to manage it all of a sudden you're going to have the potential for milk in a way that just trucking in truckloads of milk, you know, is, yeah. is, is like buying fertilizer. So that's where that fertilizer factory is what really living compost is. And the beauty of it is versus chemical fertilizer, or even sometimes when we're depending on organic substitutes for chemical fertilizer, but still approaching and treating the soil as an inert dead medium that we're injecting nutrients into. When you use compost every year, that soil gets better and better. So you get better results every year with the same amount of compost applied, or you can apply less and less and you still get the same yields. Whereas the opposite's true with the, with a lot of the others is every year your soil gets more dead mm -hmm. and you get more dependent on that injection of chemical fertilizer. It's like a drug, you know, and, and mm -hmm. you, you have to uh, dial it up a little bit to get the same impact. And that's the beauty of natural systems and God's design is it's so forgiving. It's abundant. It's, you know, it's safe. It's hard like compost. You can't over apply it because it regulates itself. And uh, there's just so, so many benefits to um, using it in our gardens, not only for just the health of our plants, but for unlocking the nutrients that we need to benefit from the plants that we're actually eating. So enough yep. of an introduction there. Sorry. Oh, no, that's, that, that's great. I'm going to, I'm going to synthesize it a little bit. And so dirt is dead. Soil yep. is alive. Compost is what takes dead dirt and turns it into a live soil. And you want a live soil because that's what ultimately feeds your plants, which ultimately is feeding you and your animals and, and everything else. And awesome so you, summary. Yeah. You laid that out so well and beautifully. And so let's, Talk about a minute for how do how do you make compost? And again, we're we're getting to the troubleshooting at the heart of it. But what's just the basic concept? And and I realized that day I was talking to somebody that I've actually talked to a lot, and I and I, I figured they knew, but they they weren't even sure about browns and greens and nitrogen and carbon. So if you can just run us through simply the basics of building a compost pile, maybe not the details, but but what it takes. Yeah. Well, we don't see compost piles in nature, right? You go out and there's not like right. all these amazing compost piles. So it's an it's a bit of an uh, a choreographed, um, you know, speed up of what we naturally see happening all the time in the forest right. floor, in the pasture floors. Uh, so <clears throat> what we're trying to do is we're trying to kind of get that living skin that's there in every healthy soil that's mm -hmm. between the organic matter and the minerals right. and have it so we can apply that in bulk onto our gardens to really supercharge our soil. And, well, and if I can interrupt for just a second, yeah. that's what we need to do, right? Because you're right. Nature doesn't quite build it this way. We're mimicking nature because we're asking for more production in a specific way from nature. So we've got to find a way to accelerate the process. Right, right. Yeah. And I think we have that agency to be able to mimic mm -hmm. what God's done but reorganize it for, you know, uh, something that it would output that it wouldn't normally. And we also have a responsibility, like you said, to be generous back to the land 
because we're taking from it in a way that just the static kind of like natural forest, you know, is not having those demands put on it. So mm -hmm. really what we're wanting to do, compost is a, is when we apply it to our garden, it's organic matter that is in the process of decomposition that's full of those microbes. So you don't want it undecomposed um, because it's not going to uh, the, be uh, promoting like enough of the, uh, the life and it's not going to, you know, benefit the soil as much because it's going to be fresh and all that kind of stuff. And we don't want it fully decomposed because then it's like the microbes are done, you know, and, and it's just, you know, it, it, we want them kind of happy in the midst of this uh, partially decomposed to mostly decomposed material. And so what the simple, there's lots of different ways to do it, but what you're going to do is you're going to start with raw organic material, and then you're going to create conditions where those microbes that you want to culture in that material are really happy. Mm -hmm. And the microbes that we want that are really happy are aerobic microbes, microbes that breathe oxygen and not the smelly, stinky anaerobic ones that uh, normally are way down deeper in the soil. Uh, so we want to create um, just those ideal conditions that can be lots of different methods, styles. You know, they can be happier or less happy, but still get, you know, still decompose the stuff to a degree. We can put it on the garden in the end. Uh, but that's typically what we're doing. And you can, you know, so the materials we're picking, the conditions we're giving them, all those kind of things uh, factor into how happy the microbes are going to be. And the happier the microbes are throughout the process, the more life is going to be in that compost when we put it on the garden. And that's what's the beauty of compost. It's so forgiving because, you know, you can, quote, mess up something you intended to do in terms of when you flipped your pile or maybe it got a little too wet or something like that. And most of the time, it's still going to be great, a great product to put on your garden. It just, you know that next time there's probably some potential for the quality that you could have had that you maybe didn't just because you missed yeah. that, you know, but for me, it's like, if my brother gets married on one weekend, I've got to go to the wedding and I don't turn the pile when I wanted to, no big deal. You know, it may not, I may have killed off a bit of my microbes because I let it overheat, but it's still going to make great stuff for the dirt. I, I love the freedom that you give us in working, you know, with those elements to bring compost together because, you know, it's, it's okay. If you don't get it just perfect, it's still going to work. And you know, in, in a lot of learning for compost and some of the things I learned where you're, you're trying to get towards humus, but it, it, it takes the process so technical and so far that that you do start to move past that biologically active state, I think, in, in some of the ways that I learned. And it was really eye opening to be there with you. And for you guys that don't know, Noah's uh, we're producing a class for the School of Traditional Skills where Noah's taking you through all of this. And, and I learned a ton being there. And that was one of the things that really freed me up was like feeling a little okay. Like, okay, it's not finished. That's not only okay, it actually might be a really good thing because maybe I'm taking it too far and getting it so far broken down that I'm losing some of the benefit by the time it gets to getting it into the garden or wherever it's going. So I, I really appreciate your approach there. And so, okay, so you're creating compost. Tell what are the basic elements again? Just, you know, talk about greens and browns. People don't know what that means. And so to just shape the discussion of some of this troubleshooting, they need a little bit more context. Yeah, because if you understand, uh, us as farmers, when we go out on the farm, whatever we're farming, uh, whether it's, you know, vegetables or it's animals, you know, our job is like to make them all happy, right? Like when you go do the chores, you go out all the in the barn, all the animals are like, Moo, meh, you know, and, and you, mm -hmm. you feed them, you give them water. And then there's this contented happiness and you go inside. So the same thing when we approach our compost pile, we have to know like, what are we, what are we trying to make happy here? And our big categories of microbes that we're trying to make happy are our bacteria and our fungus. So the bacteria is what gets our pile hot and it what's, it's what does a lot of the initial decomposition and they're the aerobic microbes. So they want the oxygen. And then the second is the fungus and the fungus kind of come in later when the pile is cooled and they kind of start breaking down the heavier, chunky stuff and, and going through the pile. So we want to uh, put, because we want both bacteria and fungus in our compost when it's finished, because our soil needs both those things, we're going to put two different, we're going to feed the pile what those like. 
So bacteria love sugars. So when we say a green material, a green material is a plant material that was cut when it was green, which means it had plenty of sugar content in its leaves. And just like when we cut hay, we're, we're keeping that energy in there, that sugar, so we can feed mm -hmm. it to our animals later. It stays, right? The sugars stay in it. It may turn brown. So that's what's confusing about it. It may look not like green anymore, but it's green because it was cut green. So it has the sugars in it. And when we feed that to our micro, to our, when we put that in our pile, it is the food source for the bacteria. It's what makes them really happy. And they love decomposing that. The fungus, on the other hand, they like more of a woody material. They like to decompose things where the sugars have already left, kind of like <clears throat> woody stuff. Or if you ever see, you know, in the woods, there's often the, uh, you know, your, your sticks or your brown leaves. That's what's got fungus growing up into it. So that's where our brown material is stuff we're going to collect that was already brown when we cut it. That means the sugar's already left, like a corn stalk at the end of the season versus mm. earlier or straw after you've harvested the grain from it, you know, or leaves that turn brown and then fell off the tree. And those are going to be what make our fungus happy. So right. that's what why we want to put that in there. Um, so you can make compost with just a green, you know, or maybe just a brown. But, it, you know, in order to get that good balance, both of those are necessary. And then the other ingredient that we put in as well is the uh, uh, nitrogen source. So we separate that out because nitrogen we say is like nutrition for decomposition. It is what the bacteria, it's like the fuel the bacteria need to break down that sugar, to break down those greens. And that's the one ingredient that you want to kind of practice getting right. Because we talked about how we want our pile to be mostly decomposed, but not all the way decomposed. We want to end that process of decomposition. Uh, by adding, like a lot of, in nature, on the surface of the soil, because microbes are functioning right there most of the decomposition is happening on the top of the ground in the woods or in the pastures they can utilize the nitrogen from the air like that's the nitrogen they can use and that slow release that slow decomposition if we want to speed it up we give them that nitrogen through a manure or through a legume into the pile and it allows them to work really hard really fast and get a lot of that done quickly <clears throat> but if we give them too much then they will the pile will never cool down. Like will take a very long time to cool down because they will have so much fuel that, that you'll keep turning it and managing it and it's going to stay hot. And then it'll kind of like decompose into almost nothing <laughs> mm -hmm. before it cools off a bit. And then you have like really nice, like some humus, but there's not like this fertilizer factory in, in process that you have a lot of to put around your garden. So that's what too much nitrogen can look like. Not enough means they won't, it won't heat up at all. And it takes a very long time to decompose because they're just using what they have available in the air or that kind of stuff. So those are the brown greens, nitrogens, the greens feed the bacteria, the browns are to feed the fungus. And then the nitrogen is to give fuel to the bacteria just enough so that they decompose the pile to about a third to a quarter of its initial, you know, uh, mass where yeah. then you can apply it. Love it. Good. And I, and I love your approach. You, you, you're you one of the first people I've heard break out nitrogens from greens and give a little deeper explanation there. And I think that's very, very helpful. Yeah. And so essentially, you guys, you're combining these materials in a ratio. You can find those ratios a lot of places. Noah's probably got resources. Noah's going to have a class for you at School of Traditional Skills. So lots of places for you to get that to build your pile. We're going to kind of zip ahead here, assume that you've tried this a few times. Um, or at least you're going to learn something that you're going to know what you see if you are going out for the first time to try it. And so, Noah, we get our compost pile built, right? It's, uh, uh, accumulating, assimilating all these materials. And that's really the easy part for most people. They can go out and they, they you know, see one of my videos or one of yours or read something in a book and they put it together. But then it doesn't work the way they think it's going to. Um, what are a couple of the common problems that people see? And let's start digesting that a little bit. Um, cause that, that's where people really get stuck and it's hard to figure out, you know, the, the pile either gets too hot or it gets too cold or it gets stinky. Um, you can probably speak to the most common problems a little better than I can, but what do you see people struggling with? Yeah, I think, you know, if they're trying to make a thermal compost pile, where it gets hot so it can neutralize weed seeds and other stuff, then, you know, it not getting hot is a common first, you know, challenge that a lot of people face. Um, and 
So a lot of times that just has to do with, it, it really almost always goes back to either not enough moisture mm -hmm. in your pile or not enough nitrogen in your pile. And that's a simple fix because you can just turn your pile, add some more water, add a bit more nitrogen, whether that's um, you know a legume or it's an animal manure, just a little bit, you know, because it's easier to add it than it is to take it away if you put too much in and then see if it gets hot. <clears throat> and uh, again, it's helpful rather than just this mysterious, you know, black box of like, why is it not working? We understand that like there's these microbes in there, these living things that we've got to, if we can give them the ideal conditions, if they're happy, it's going to work great. If they're not happy that's probably why something's going wrong. So we can always go back to, do they have, like, did I do a food source? Do they have moist, enough moisture? Do they have oxygen in the pile? Mm -hmm. uh, and if norm, a lot of times we can notice things that might be off that I think it's neat because God's given us like a, a real natural ability to notice um, things that don't look healthy. Mm -hmm. You know, we'd be like, that just doesn't look right. You know, and, and so that kind of comes back to as a farmer, as a gardener, like understanding those, you know, kind of the things that most uh, living things need to be happy, which is their food source, the right environment or shelter or, you know, not, not, not too wet, not too dry. Um, and then a food, you know, like the nitrogen or whatever, whatever things that they tend to like. And mm -hmm. that's why I explain the compost making like I do with the microbes and the food sources and all that, because it helps you to, to understand when you understand that behind the scenes, what's going on, it helps you to see with a little bit different eyes when something's not going right. Um, what might be off. Yeah. Yeah. We got to practice those observation skills. Um, so let's talk about if, if the pile's not heating up, that's, that's one issue. And then that, that's a common issue. And so you said it could be not enough water, not enough nitrogen, I think I'd add, and you'd agree, it could not be large enough. That can be yes. an issue as well. Um, let's first talk about if it's not moist enough. How do you know if it's not moist enough and you need to add water? Yeah, so a simple test that we teach people is called the squeeze test. It's similar to the way that people test soil when they're you know, plowing. Um, you just take from the inside of the pile where it's supposed to be active, not the outside where it's always going to be drier but in the inside and you take some material out and you squeeze it in your hand. And if when you open your hand up, <clears throat> the material just falls apart. Like it's loose, you know, kind of like just kind of mm -hmm. doesn't stay together. It's probably too dry. Um, if you squeeze it and water is just running all down your wrist and out of your fingers, it may be that you have too much water. You don't really want it squishing out of the material. Um, in that case, you might want to, um, turn your pile and just let it like to help it dry out a bit and make, yeah. maybe you have to, if you're in a really rainy area, put some kind of shed roof over it or build it under a shed or something. And then if you squeeze it and you open your hand up, no water's like oozing out of it when you squeeze it. But if you open your hand up and it kind of stays together in a nice little like clump, but not too compacted, then that's what we're kind of shooting for where it's got that cohesiveness because of the moisture, but it's not dripping wet with water. So if you squeeze it, you open your hands up and it falls apart. You want to turn it while adding water. You're not going to wet your pile by just running a hose on the top. Yeah. <laughs> it just does not go through the material. So turn your pile and wet the material with a watering can or a hose or something as you turn it. And that should get that moisture back in there. And the same like this, if it's too wet, you're also going to turn it, but you're just going to uh, let it air out, maybe even leave it kind of partially turned for an hour or two and then finish it. And it'll kind of let a lot of that excess moisture evaporate off. Good, good. Um, one that's a little more tricky, and I think you hinted at this, and that is what if you've not fed those microbes and that bacteria well enough with nitrogen? How do you know? How, how, do, how do you tell? You know, so I assume to me, that's why I went to the water first, because that's the fastest thing you can do. You can test for water. Um, but say you look like you got your water content right. You're feeling good about that. And you're, it's not heating up. Um, to me, that starts to lean towards, you know, lack of nitrogen. But how do you know? How do you test that? I know. 
Yeah, well, you know, it's kind of like troubleshooting anything. Like when you're doing a small engine, it's like, well, is it electrical? No, nope. okay, all the electrical's good. Maybe it's the air, you know, and you check the air filter. And so some of this is process of elimination. It's not like you just like, oh, it's that um, yeah. every single time. Because sometimes I'll be using a new nitrogen source and I don't really know how potent it is. You know, mm -hmm. like how many wheelbarrow loads do I need? I'm just going to have to try something. And uh, so sometimes that's where keeping good records you know, remembering what you're doing, what you did last time. That's why you've got to be bad at something before you can be good at it. Sometimes, you know, a lot of people. Like, oh. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you teach, you do something and people are like, ah, man, you're amazing how you did that. But it's like, yeah, it's my 20th time. And the first five times I did it, it failed miserably, you know? So we've got to be willing to go through, not that we fail miserably, but like you, you, you do get better at it as you do it. So that's okay. It's sometimes you just, you want to learn through experience, but as, uh, as, um, in my experience, if I've eliminated the water as, you know, the water as a probable problem by testing, it looks like it's got the right amount of moisture. Then I will look at, you know, are there any other reasons that it might not be getting hot? One of which for what you said is it may not be big enough. And I just want to touch on that because, um, if you're especially trying to get a thermal pile going, the outside of a pile, because it's exposed to the elements, unless you are covering it with something, you know, some people will minimize this by covering it with a wool blanket, something that allows that moisture and like ideal conditions to go all the way to the surface of the pile. But in most cases, we're just leaving the outside open. And that means you're going to have about eight inches on the outside of your pile from, you know, into your pile. Mm -hmm. It's probably going to be too dry and too exposed to the sun or elements to actually be in those ideal conditions for decomposition. So that means if you've got eight inches on both sides and you only have like a two foot tall, like pile in diameter, you know, you've already got 16 inches, of the cross section, eight inches on both mm -hmm. sides that are not in ideal conditions to actually get hot. So the central, central part here that actually should be is almost a, nothing of the pile. Right. It's a fraction of the pile. So that's where a lot of the compost piles tend to work better the bigger they are because a higher percentage of the pile is actually a uh, material is actually in those ideal conditions in the center of the pile. Um, but once you've done that and you look back at, and, and you know, everything seems to be good and you can normally think about your, your nitrogen and, and if it just try it, just if you added six wheelbarrow loads and you're not got you didn't get anything with the size pile that you did add another one or two, you know, one, one and a half. And, and the same thing, like when you did the water, you're going to turn your pile and kind of mix it in, you know, sprinkle it a little bit every couple of layers as you turn it in order to get that back in and see if it, it, uh, you know, starts getting hot, um, at that point in time. And, uh, the nice thing is, is in, in general, uh, if you, if you're getting just the basic ratios of like what we normally say is. 40 40 to 45% brown and green each so you have end up with 80 to 90% of your piles brown and green and then you're doing about 10% of your pile material is a nitrogen like uh some kind of animal manure or chicken manure with a little bedding mixed in to cut it um or if you're using a legume like a bean or pea vine residue or something like that you want more like 20% if you stick close like even remotely close to those ratios you're really not going to deal with a whole lot of you know, like you're going to have some degree of success. It may be slower in getting hot um, if you didn't add quite enough, but it's most likely going, you know, going to get hot. So size is real important. You got to have enough volume, enough mass. So that three to four foot cube, I think you say four foot. Did you say that a minute ago? Yeah, we uh, normally recommend a minimum four by four by four pile for the style that we do, which is a little more of a homestead scale kind of production uh, for thermal compost. Obviously there's a lot of smaller scale backyard kind of, systems that you can do it with but yeah for that kind of pile well and you guys if you're going to put the effort in and you're serious about composting to build soil to grow food for your family you need that you need more than that you're going to be doing a few piles a year at least so so no reason to just even think about going smaller than that even though there's a lot of stuff out there that might point you in that direction you want to just ditch it and and get to this right size so you got the right volume you got the right moisture content. If you got those things in place and you're not heating up, I think we know what you're saying is then it's, I think by that process of elimination, you can probably go to, Hey, I probably need a little more nitrogen in there and mix that in, in the turn. Right. Right. You start with conditions. Are the conditions good? 
yeah. the conditions are good, it's probably ingredients. And in that case, it's normally the nitrogen. Segway for a minute. Um, you've mentioned several times thermal composting, thermal pile. And some of our, our listeners may not know that terminology. And there and they're actually maybe a little more confusion because I've actually heard it used a little different than you use it. So mm-hmm. tell us what you mean by a thermal pile, which is what we're talking about building here. This is what you're building in your homestead. This is what you teach in the class. And then where you teach in person, this is what I do and teach. So tell us what you mean by thermal. Yeah, so the three big, broad simplistic categories of composting we talk about are static composting, thermal composting, and vermicomposting. Um, Static composting, you know, is where you're just piling stuff up and letting it rot, and you're not doing a whole lot of management, and especially if you're doing that on the ground, um, and, you know, you're keeping some carbon in there, so it's not just some raw vegetables or something. It it normally turns into something, you know, a great uh, addition for the soil. Uh, the challenges with that is it a lot of times takes a long time. You don't end up often with consistent um, compost because it's, mm-hmm. you know, you're not stirring it and those kind of things. And a lot of weed seeds or other stuff can make their way into there and then make their way into the garden. Um, you know, if I leave a, some of my invasive grasses, if I have a static compost pile, they'll move into that pile mm-hmm. because it's yeah. not hot and it's not being stirred up. Um, but it's great for if you're not going to do a big pile you know, a little bit of a static, you know, just have a bucket or something with holes in it to, for it to breathe and you can pile stuff up. We have like a little static pile outside our house where we put some kitchen scraps, you know, cause it's like, I can't always put them in a thermal pile. Sometimes I can't feed them all to the chickens at that point. And we'll just put them in a little pile where we'll eventually it rots down and we use it, you know, around the farm. But the, um, the, uh, thermal compost is where you're basically, uh, going the extra mile to maintain ideal conditions um, for rapid decomposition. And it's called thermal because when you, I, you create those ideal conditions, the microbes, the aerobic microbes will give off heat as part of that decomposition process. And uh, so it requires a little bit more management to create a thermal pile, uh, just to, mm-hmm. to turn it, to maintain the mon- you know, moisture levels and just to monitor that. But I find that uh, if you're depending on your compost, if you're not, you know, small scale thermal uh, static composting is great. If like for us, we just got to get rid of some kitchen material in a nice, you know, way without throwing it in the trash can. Right. But when you have a large garden, you actually are making compost for the sake of wanting compost. You know, Mm -hmm. you want good compost. You want a lot of it. And that's where thermal is a much better way to get that because it's quick. You can do it in as little as eight weeks without having to be super intense in your management of it, like some methods. And it's consistent in its output uh, in terms of quality and the heat helps to uh, kill weed seeds or any, you know, diseased material like diseased tomato vines or something that might be in that pile so that then it's really safe to put onto your garden. And then vermicompost is using worms to make compost, to compost material. And that's actually one of the best options if you're in, a, in, a, in an area like an urban setting where you don't have the space or the material to make compost on a large scale. Uh, your vermicompost can make it a highly valuable, really um, super living um, microbial compost in a small area using earthworms. Nice. Cool. Uh, thanks for that description. Let's move from a pile that's not heating up to a pile that, that well, can it overheat? That's the next logical question. Just, you know, the opposite of, of not heating up enough and decomposing. Can you, can it get too hot? What do you do? And what is too hot? Yeah. Um, the, the problem with uh, the heat can be if you let it sit too long, uh, in a really, you know, in a, in a state where the microbes are happy and, and producing a lot of heat, they can eventually uh, create so much that it begins to kill them off. So it kind of decreases the life in that compost pile because of it being too hot. And uh, we normally kind of are shooting for an ideal temperature cooking of, you know, 130, 140 to 160 right in there, kind of around 150 kind of range. Um, and we just simply insert some metal rod in our pile and we pull it out and it's uncomfortable to hold on to it. Uh, it's not just warm, like, yeah, it's kind of warm, 
but you feel and you're like, woo, that's hot. Then it's probably where we want it to be cooking, but we mm -hmm. really don't want to leave it if possible more than three days after that. So normally once it reaches that temperature, we'll let it cook for three days at that temperature. And then that's when we would like to put on the calendar to turn it um, so that we minimize that die off due to too much exposure to the heat. So turning it will help it cool down. If it does seem to be getting too hot, um, that's normally just the solution. It'll kind of set those bacteria back and, and bring the temperature back down. And then, you know, if, uh, if it really, uh, if it's really, for some reason you've added way too much nitrogen and it's spiking temperatures well above 150 and it's going to 180, you know, whatever, then sometimes you can, um, take your pile and spread it out a little bit. Um, so that it, you're minimizing those ideal, you know, yeah. um, spot in the middle just until they kind of settle down some, and then you can start piling it a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, higher and bigger. And that's just too much nitrogen. I think you said, just to clarify, if it's getting that hot, like if you're getting 160 and above and holding it there and, and then too much nitrogen. Yep. Yeah. And yep. The, also, the other problem is you'll keep turning it. And normally you want to hit that temperature for three days of three times before mm -hmm. the pile starts to cool off. You're not going to be hitting that temperature every week for the whole eight, eight weeks. It's just going to be for the first three turns, ideally, maybe four. And then after that, you want them to kind of run out of that nitrogen and start tapering off in temperature so that the fungus can come in and do their job. So if I put too much nitrogen, sometimes it's just like it heats up and it keeps heating up and it keeps heating up and it keeps heating yeah. up, you know, and doesn't stop. You could choose if you wanted to, in that case, to add some more material like yeah. green and browns but you're kind of starting the clock over at that point in time, back at the beginning of the eight weeks, because you're reintroducing fresh material, yeah. you know, so you may or may not choose to do that. Okay. Uh, another big one, we're, we've, we're covering a lot here, which is great, but another big one is it gets stinky. It gets just a bad smell to it. And that's one that both people are afraid of and, and people experience a fair amount. What, what are, how do, how do you start figuring that out if, if it's starting to have a smell or, or, you know, what is some smells that people should go, whoa, there's a problem here. Right, right. I mean, it depends on what you're composting. Most of the composting we do for our homestead, for the gardens, we're just using, you know, plant material and some animal manures. We're not decomposing dead chickens or, you know, tons of, you know, uh, mm -hmm. rotten vegetable scraps and those kind of weird, you know, weird things that could really make it a bit funky but in general uh you want your compost to be smelling uh very quickly earthy you know like the mm -hmm. forest floor not something that you should be willing to stick it all the way up in your face and inhale and like oh that like has a good earthy smell to it if it's stinky that is normally an indicator of anaerobic decomposition that means decomposition by microbes that don't breathe oxygen and the problem with them is they part of the byproduct of their decomposition can be toxins toxins that smell bad and can even harm your plants potentially so we don't want those guys decomposing stuff in our pile and it normally can be traced back to some way that we have um allowed our pile to lose uh areas that have the presence of oxygen you know you don't want to put your compost in a solid plastic container you don't want to mm -hmm. cover it tightly with solid piece of plastic you know you want that pile to breathe we really encourage people to put in their piles chunky woody material while they build it, it may not fully decompose by the end of the pile. You could add it to the next, but putting things like pine cones and sticks and chunky stuff just gives it that structure that keeps it from settling and compacting and then souring, mm -hmm. which is what often causes those kinds of conditions. So if it is souring, it is starting to smell a little bit, then that's where you probably need to either turn it or find some, find what is causing you know, oxygen to not get to the pile and try to fix the conditions so that it will. Now, initially you may have a bit of smell if you're again processing your, your, maybe your manure will smell initially, probably will. Mm. Uh, you know, if you're processing, yeah. if you're, if you're doing guts or something nasty, yeah, the first time, maybe the first turn, it'll still smell a bit. Yeah. But 
within a few weeks, it shouldn't be smelling worse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's a whole nother conversation, decomposing animals and things like that, which I actually do a fair amount of because there's a lot of good nutrient in them. But yeah. Yeah. That, that's a whole nother process. It freaks some people out, but it's very doable, but right. definitely kind of another skill set. So probably, especially if you're getting started, you're figuring this out, stick to the basics and, and stick to your, your, your manures and your greens and your browns and, and just get the process down. That's going to help you out a lot. And, and then eventually you can move on to some of those other, you know, other things. Um, let's see here. I know we're, we're getting low on time, but I had a couple more I really wanted to cover for people. And um, how do you know when it's ready? Yep. You know, how, how, where, where do you know? And, and I think you're pretty forgiving in your answer, but, you know, there's a point where you want to get it so far at least. So how do you know when it's ready? And the follow up to that is how long can I leave it sit there if I'm not ready to use it when it's ready? Yeah. Yeah. Well, what you were looking for is we're looking for that active kind of unnaturally choreographed decomposition that we've created in a pile. You know, it, when it's up to 160 degrees and it's going to town with all the microbes, in it, that is not something that happens on the forest floor. <laughs> so right. if we take that material and we put it right there on our plants, you know, at that stage, you're probably going to have some really bad things happen because it is not what the soil is used to having. Correct. So we've done that. <laughs> so right. we earn the corn. Yeah, we can food. always go back to like, what do we do? We see this in in creation or not? You know, and if we don't, then we probably, you know, that's the probably why it's the problem. So we want it to be have settled its engine down back to the normal idle of decomposition, like idling, like an engine idling that mm -hmm. we see in nature. Correct. So that means um, it's going to be not getting hot anymore. Um, and if it, by the, normally we say at, by the end of eight weeks, that's normally given enough time for the microbes to do its work where it's pretty safe and in that kind of slow idling, you know, fertilizer factory um, state that we really want it to be in when we put it onto our garden. Because um, mm -hmm. again, we want it to kind of look like that. Tr you know, like when you go to the forest floor and you open it up, there's this transitionary phase yeah. uh, between the fresh leaves that have fallen on the top and the, the, the unrecognizable, just like black stuff or like, um, minerals underneath where it's kind of mm -hmm. that partially decomposed. And if you look, that's where most of the feeder roots are. That's where most of the life is of the soil. Yep. That's the, that's the gold level of the skin of the earth. And so we kind of want our compost to look like that when we're putting it doesn't have to be this coffee ground thing. Mm. doesn't mean it's bad if it's like that, but it doesn't have to be this coffee ground thing. Um, but we probably don't want it looking fresh. And we definitely yeah. don't want it still in that active decomposition stage. Is there, can we define that by temperature for those people that like to get a little more technical? And I know sometimes, and I've been in a situation where I've got compost, seems too hot, um, but I really, I'm ready to get it out, you know, and, and get it on. I need, I need to amend some soil and get to planting and you need to take a temperature. Is there, is, is there a temperature that's safe? Like if it's below a hundred or below 80 degrees or something like that, um, is, is you can can we measure it that way? Yeah, I haven't in the past. I just, it, you know, if it's a different temperature than, you know, the soil and ambient temperature around, if it's, you know, elevated in whatever degree, then, um, then that's, you know, I, I'm in a situation in Alabama where I probably don't have to think about that like you do. So it would be, you know, you could have an act like a pile that's healthy and that is not going to be the temperature of the ambient, you know, you know, negative 20 or whatever. Right. And you're like, right. I can use it. It's, it's 70 degrees. It's probably safe to use, even though yeah. it's not ambient temperature out. But for most of the time for us, you know, once it gets down in that just normal, you know, 50 to 80 degrees, just kind of the no different than most of the surrounding normal active ground and environment around it, then we consider that safe to put onto our plants if it's hotter than your if you go take a temperature reading of your beds you know you're 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 out there and, mm -hmm. and the, the natural decomposition if it's hotter than those normally are then you might be you know you might can get away with it but again we're shooting for 
happy plants with compost on it that's at a state that those plants are used to interacting with. Yeah, yeah, good. I kind of just reach my hand into it and if it's much warmer than my hand, you know, and I'm gonna be planting right now, uh, you know, I, I don't want it to feel, I certainly don't want it to feel hot to my hand. Right. Right, if I'm gonna be putting seeds in it. Right, exactly. Yeah. Cool. Well, Noah, I know we've kind of passed the hour a little bit and, and we could probably carry on for another hour or two. There's so much so much fun stuff to dissect here, but I think uh, we can encourage people to take this and run with it. And there's a lot of resources out there uh, for them. Uh, your class coming up or maybe out by the time this comes up where Noah takes you all the way through this in, in detail. But Noah also has a lot of resources himself. Uh, on a lot of things besides compost. And I really want to encourage you all to get to know Noah. So let us know where, where do you want people to come um, say hi or find out more about what you're doing? Yeah, if they, people go to redeemingthedirt.com, there's um, some information on there. We have links to Redeeming the Dirt Academy, which is our kind of free online platform where we do have some recordings of us teaching composting. And, you know, it's got a community on there. Uh, and then we also have links there to the Wellwater Garden Project website, which is wellwatergardenproject.org. But there's a link at redeemingthedirt.com and people can go there and download our free PDF, which walks people through how to plant that simple garden and teach people in their community. So if they go to redeemingthedirt.com, they should be able to find links to most of all those. Very cool. Well, you guys go check that out and jump into sharing the good news of Jesus and gardens. We'll see you all soon. It's been good hanging with you.